Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for logging on for this RIOS PD Plus session, all on synthetic biology. Uh, today, we'll be hearing from Desmond Lunn from the Centre for Computational and Integrative Biology at Rutgers University, and Claudia Vickers from the Australian Institute for Bioengineering and Nanotechnology at the University of Queensland. And they'll be here to talk about the new field of synthetic biology and its applications. So first off, we're going to have uh, two presentations from Claudia and Desmond, and then that will be followed by an opportunity for you to ask questions. If you just type the questions into the text box, I'll moderate those and ask them to the speakers on your behalf. So with no further ado, we'll hand over to Claudia. Thanks very much, Lisa. So I'm going to talk today about synthetic biology and try to give you a bit of very basic background about what's happening in the field, what it is, and um, where we might be going into the future. So this is going to be a very brief historical perspective of where we came from and where we are now in synthetic biology. So start, the story starts in 1865, where a chap called uh, Gregor Mendel discovered that genes can actually be inherited and passed on from one generation to another. They didn't at that time know about DNA, but they shortly found out about it. And it wasn't for another 100 years that these two very famous people, Watson and Crick, discovered the DNA structure. Crick went on then to work with a chap called Gamow, and they developed what's called the central dogma of genetics, or of molecular biology. And that's this, this idea that you start with something called DNA, and the DNA then is copied to a, a RNA message which carries the, the code from... Um, the, the nuclear material out into the cell and then that RNA message is translated into a protein and the protein is the actual workhorse in the cell. Now, things are actually a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the basic sort of setup and it, it generally works for most basic stories. Uh, in 1996, the actual genetic code itself was cracked, so we could then read the DNA that we're using or looking at that's actually telling the, the um, message to the RNA and then taking that through to the protein. And in 1972, we discovered that DNA could be cut and pasted next to each other, and that was really the dawn of genetic modification as we know it today. 1980, a chap called Kerry Mullis invented a process called polymerase chain reaction. And what that meant is that not only could we read the genetic code, but we could then write the genetic code, or at least copy it from a template. So that was a great start, and there are two major advances that allowed us to use those things to their full potential. So the first is automated DNA sequencing, high throughput DNA sequencing. So we'll be we're now able to actually um, read the DNA very quickly and lots of it at one time. And that allowed us to sequence the human genome in 2007. The second thing in the last decade or so has been um, automated DNA synthesis. So we can write the DNA code and we don't actually need a template to to copy it off, we can actually take something completely novel and write it. And we can still copy, copy from a template. And we can do this simply by calling up or emailing a company and sending them the sequence that we want them to make, and they'll make it for us and send it back. And then we can work with that in the lab. So the costs of both of those two very important technologies are decreasing rapidly, particularly the DNA sequencing, um, the, sorry, the DNA synthesis is dropping by about 50% every two years, which is an extremely rapid uh, progress. So that has allowed us to do things like create what some people are referring to as synthetic life. And this lad called um, um, Craig Venter started a eponymously named J. Craig Venter Institute in October 2006. And it was just a year later that he was able to take a genome out of a biological cell, out of a living bacterial cell, and transplant it into another cell whose own genome had been removed. And then he could observe that that cell grow and behave like the original bacterium from which he took the genome. So that was the first step in, in towards synthetic life. The second step was to take a minimal genome. So take that genome and get rid of a whole lot of genes that weren't necessary for the organism to actually survive and reproduce and grow. And then in May 2010, he took a genome and actually recreated it from scratch. So using that polymerase chain reaction and another, a number of other techniques, he was able to um, recreate the, the minimal genome that he had developed and then transfer that into a living cell, into a cell which had been emptied of its own genome, kickstart it and get it to grow and divide. 
And when he was doing that, he actually inserted a gene that encoded for a blue dye. And that's why this organism he created called Cynthia is actually blue when you look on it and it on a Petri dish. So that's, I guess, the first step towards truly synthetic life. Remember, though, that this is a copied genome. So it's not like an absolutely new genome where every gene is designed by the, uh, the original user. It's actually templated off a genome that still exists. So some people think this is synthetic life. Some people think this is almost synthetic life. The thing that I really want you to take away from today is the idea that as biological engineers and as synthetic biologists, we see cells as living programmable machines. So very much in the way that a computer might be thought of as a whole lot of components together. So you have a memory card, you have a sound card, you have a, a keyboard and a mouse and a CPU and all these other little bits and pieces that together provide you with the functionality allowing you to do a whole lot of different things with the computer. A living cell is also made up of little bits and pieces that together allow you allow the cell to have the functionality to grow, divide and reproduce. So we think of the cell sort of like a computer. Of course, cells are just a little bit more complicated than a computer. So this is like a net, a network or a map, like almost like an electrical circuit, but a very complicated electrical circuit, of course. And this particular network that you're looking at here is only half of the, the um, reactions that we know to actually occur inside a cell. We, in order to understand this, we actually model this. And you'll hear a little bit more about this from Desmond in just a minute. Um, so we use a computer to model what's going on in this thing that we call a metabolic network and to be able to predict how it behaves under certain environmental conditions. So synthetic biology is a tool. It's a blend of biology, genetics and engineering. And what we're doing is redesigning parts that already exist in the cell or creating new biological parts and devices to do particular things or to get the cell to do things that it wouldn't otherwise do things that we want it to do rather than things that it would naturally do. And if we want to uh, go to a sort of a shopping centre to go and pick off the shelf the little bits and pieces that we need for, the, for this, we go to a place called Biobricks, which is a registry of parts that all work together. So, for example, if you took a Ford car and you put something from a Toyota on it, it wouldn't fit very well. You actually want the pieces to fit together neatly. And this registry makes sure that the little bits and pieces that we use to modify the cell are actually going to work properly together. So it's sort of like a toolbox and it's freely available to the scientific community. And I also want you to take away that synthetic biology isn't just synthetic life. There's a whole lot of other things that it entails. So what can we make with this synthetic biology? Well, lots of kind of cool looking things. So on your left hand side here, you can see um, two Petri dishes with bacteria that in the top one, it's sort of being just sort of painted like a picture of a horse. And the bottom one, um, it's actually a little bit of uh, synthetic biology art, I guess. But the both, in both of those cases, the cells are expressing a protein which is fluorescing. And it's fluorescing in response to different environmental stimuli. So in particular, the one at the bottom has a range of different environmental stimuli that are being applied to it. And it's fluorescing different colors in response to those different stimuli. On the right hand side, you can see cells that are behaving as if they were photographic film. So they're responding to light. And the chap at the bottom is someone you ought to all be able to recognize. Um, this film takes a little while to actually develop, so it probably won't be replacing normal film anytime soon. But you can imagine the sort of applications that you might be able to use this for. So we can also do some, some more perhaps important things in, in terms of human treatment. Um, and one example that I really like to use is a, a product called artemisinin, which is an anti-malarial treatment. It was developed by, um, in the lab of a guy called Jay Keesling in the States. So malaria kills one to three million people every year, and 90% of those people are under the age of five. Artemisinin is an anti-malarial. It's been around for a long time and known to be an anti-malarial since about 350 AD. It was recognized in Chinese texts. It's produced in a herb called wormwood, but it takes 14 months to produce it. And there's enormous spikes in price because plants behave differently under different environmental conditions. If they get too much or too little water, then they'll change the amount of this product that, that they make. And those spikes in price are passed on to the consumer who only earns $1 a day. So they really can't afford that. The solution that Jay Keesling came up with is to engineer a bug to make artemisinin, in this case a yeast. It can make it at a fraction of the cost and 
you can make it actually get it, get it onto the market. So I think that's already been brought to market now. And that required 40 different synthetic biology components to actually make that, um, make that pathway inside the yeast. So something that we're doing in the lab is making jet fuel from sugarcane. And there's a rationale for that. So that the aviation industry depends on liquid fuels that have quite a high energy content. So it's, it's kind of hard to run planes on electricity, but some people have tried to do it. But um, for now, we need high energy content liquid fuels. And the industry is actually very strongly supporting sustainable production of aviation fuels, particularly because there's the, the um, 2020 requirement in uh, Europe, which is I think by 20 or 2025, they need to have 20% renewables. So sucrose is a renewable. It comes from photosynthesis, basically. So that, that's the sugar that is made in the sugarcane plant. Um, it's cheaper and it's more environmentally friendly than a lot of other carbon sources that are available. And of course, in Australia, it's an extremely important agricultural industry. So this is how we do it. This is um, what you're looking at here is an extremely simplified metabolic network, like you saw a little bit earlier in the presentation. And this focuses on just the main, um, the main sort of carbon network that is important for this particular product. Now, when I talk about carbon networks, I want you to imagine an electrical circuit where you have electrons zipping around in the electric circuit and getting things done and going different places. Now, this is almost the same, except that you have in your network carbon instead of electrons, and the carbon moves through the system. And we can measure that carbon and work out where it goes and try to redirect it through the system. And that's what we're doing here. So if you look at down at the bottom right-hand side where it says in red C10 and C15, that, in this case, is the um, five, 15 carbon and 10 carbon molecules that we're trying to make. And that's the part of the network that we need to engineer into the organism to get it to be jet fuel. So in Australia, um, things are going a little bit slowly compared to in the States and in, 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 in the UK. I guess in the past, I like to compare this to different, different revolutions that have happened in the past. So you've had the Industrial Revolution, you've had the Green Re Revolution or the Agricultural Revolution. We have the IT Revolution now. Right now, this is the Biological Revolution. This is a new revolution, and synthetic biology is at the cutting edge of this revolution. As I said, there's a lot going on in the USA and Europe, and you can see from all these green dots where there's different labs in the world which are doing synthetic biology. But Australia is really only just getting started. You can say there aren't very many sp spots in Australia. So it's a, th there's two good things from that. Firstly, it means that if you want to do synthetic biology, you can travel the world a lot. And secondly, it means that it's a, it's a niche and interesting and um, expanding um, industry in Australia, and it's going to be great fun to become part of it. So careers in synthetic biology, what can you work on if you're doing, it will be research and it can be in academia or in private business. In Australia, it's primarily in academia, but there's an enormous amount of um, industry that happens in the UK and in the States, of course. You need to have either a Bachelor of Science followed by a research honours degree or a Bachelor of Engineering, and that's generally chemical engineering. Both of those will take four years. And on top of that, you need to do a PhD in research, which it takes a minimum of three and a half years. And you need to focus on subjects like molecular biology, biomolecular engineering, genetic cell biology, uh, statistics are very important, and um, bioprocess engineering, etc. So what's in the future? The future, this is my view of the future at least, this thing called chassis cells. So on the top you can see you start with a chassis, which is like a stripped down cell that has a minimum number of components required for survival in it. And then you add these little modules, different modules for regulation, for carbon flux, for a particular process. It might be your product, product is toxic and you need to detoxify it, something like that. And that gives you a superbug or an engineered, a synthetically engineered organism which will uh, produce the product that you're interested in particular. So I'll just end on that and say thank you very much, everybody, and um, these are the people who support our research. Thank you, Claudia. And now we're going to hand over to Desmond Lung uh, for his presentation, and follow, following on from that, we'll have opportunity for you to ask questions to both of our speakers today. Thanks, Lisa, and thanks, Claudia. So um, what I'll try to do is um, I'll also talk about the topic of synthetic biology. I'll try to do this at somewhat of a higher level than Claudia um, and just give you a perspective, cover many of the same topics, but give you a perspective on, um, on where the field is and where it's going. 
So, um, so what is synthetic biology? Uh, at a very broad level, synthetic biology is about combining biology and engineering. So it's about using biology as a substrate, if you will, for making stuff. Um, these are a couple of quotes from a recent paper that reviewed the field of synthetic biology. Um, and, uh, and what you can see here is that the authors of this paper um, are talking about engineering, um, and they're talking about um, extending genetic engineering beyond, say, putting in a single gene into an organism into dealing with systems of genes and gene products. So this is, in some sense, the next level of genetic engineering where, with genetic engineering, we're playing with just small parts, and now we're thinking about making whole systems. And um, uh, one way to understand this is by analogy to engineering computers. Um, so com the engineering of computers is something that we've done for quite some time, and we've become quite good at it. Um, and with computers, we have um, computer engineers who have been trained to think about transistors and how transistors can come together to make logic circuits. And these things come to make modules, logic modules that eventually make up the computer. With synthetic biology, we want to do the same thing, but we want to do it with cells instead of computers. Um, and so to make up a cell at the base level, instead of having transistors, um, you have genes and you have proteins. So you have strings of DNA um, that are used to make proteins um, that serve uh, biochemical purposes inside the cell. And eventually these, these, these biochemical reactions come together to make pathways that, that carry out certain functions and eventually these things come together to make up cells. So what we have with biology is we have real cells that nature has made um, but what we want to do now as humans is to think about being able to make those cells um, ourselves. So why would you want to do this? Um, so there are many applications. Claudia has touched upon specifically uh, the applications in bioenergy, and this area is, is very large um, and, of course, very uh, relevant right now. Um, so uh, ethanol production is something that we've been doing for a long time with natural organisms but now we can start thinking about making artificial organisms that do it better than the natural organisms do. Beyond ethanol, we have other fuels such as biodiesel, biogasoline, and even biojet fuel, um, which are biological replacements, direct replacements for these fuels um, that normally come from uh, fossil fuel sources. In, uh, in drug production, many drugs are made from natural sources. So artemisinin that Claudia's talked about is made from a plant. Um, but now we can start thinking about making those things uh, in engineered organisms which can do it faster, better, and cheaper. Antibiotics um, is, a, is a large area of drugs that are made from natural sources, but there are also many anti-cancer compounds as well. Um, in the field of biomaterials, um, spider silk is a very valuable material with um, with very special quali qualities. It's got very, very high tensile strength. Um, of course, getting it from spiders is difficult, so we can get it instead from engineered organisms. Um, one example of something that has already been commercialized and is very successful um, is a polymer which is made by DuPont. Um, they've called it Serona, uh, and it's made um, primarily from a compound called 1,3-propanediol that they produce using engineered organisms. Beyond that, beyond just sort of making stuff, we can think about having organisms that can respond intelligently to their environment. And this is uh, very much like what we do with, say, electrical circuits, where we get these things to respond in some way. So with robots, we get them to respond in some way to an environment. We can start to do this with engineered organisms. And many of the exciting applications here are in biomedicine. So we can think about making bacteria that can that can find where your cancerous cells are in your body um, and kill them. Um, in infectious diseases, of course, so we, we're often infected by bacteria and viruses that do nasty things uh, to us. How about making bacteria and viruses that can fight off those bad bacteria and viruses? Okay, so my research um, also focuses in the field of bioenergy. Um, 
what we're trying to do is, um, is not to produce biofuel from biomass, um, which is where much of the work that is going on in biofuels is currently. So rather than taking a sugar, which is derived from a crop um, or from a grass, or growing up algae and then extracting fuel from those algae, what we want to do is to make an organism that actually makes fuel um, and, and directly produces it and can be harvested immediately. And the reason for that is to make uh, that fuel process very cheap. Um, so what we'd like to do is to make an organism that can directly take in sunlight and carbon dioxide and convert that directly into biodiesel, which can be um, immediately harvested, um, just skimmed off the, um, the media in which these organisms grow uh, and then immediately put into a car. To do that, we have to do large-scale metabolic engineering, so we have to make large changes to the way that these organisms metabolize chemicals, that is to say they, how they um, take up um, and convert chemicals inside the cells. And there's an another component, which is that we use computer design to do this. So just to talk a bit more about this, so why are computers important? So we've talked a lot about biology, but this is something where there's another layer of skills which is becoming increasingly important in biology today, which is to use math, uh, mathematical modeling um, and computer design. So mathematics and computer programming are starting to also become very important in biology. And so we can think about making organisms, artificial organisms, as being a pipeline where what we do is we first measure um, and try to understand how the natural organisms work, um, and then we model them. So we use math um, to model how these organisms function, um, and then we can, uh, in a computer, design how we want um, the organism to behave, and then finally go on to the implementation stage. And the reason for that is to make a process that is more efficient than if we were to just try uh, different possibilities. Okay, so why synthetic biology? So why is this happening right now and where is this going? Um, well, just to put it in perspective with something that we've all witnessed personally, um, this is a plot which shows how computational power um, has been dropping in terms of cost um, over the past 50 years. Um, or equivalently, how, sort of how much bang for your buck you get has grown over that time. So, um, if you go back 50 years to the 1960s, um, people were using what were called mini computers. Um, of course, there's, you know, these were actually very large computers. Um, but back then, you could buy um, what's shown there in the corner there is, is, um, is a machine called a DEC PDP Alpha. Um, and you could buy for about $100,000 um, a machine that could carry out about 1,000 instructions per second. And as we're all aware, there's more power um, than you get in, you know, these days in what you get in, a, in an iPhone. Um, so, uh, for example, a laptop, which you can buy for, you know, about $1,000 these days, does about a billion instructions per second. So there's been uh, 10 orders of magnitude improvement or a billion-fold improvement um, in what you get uh, in terms of computation per dollar that you spend. What's less known, though, is that DNA technologies are evolving in a similar way. So they're ex evolving in this way where there's an exponential increase in what's possible per dollar that you spend. So DNA sequencing, which has actually been going on for a long time, but only recently become a high profile activity, has also been evolving in this way. And DNA synthesis, which is the technology to make DNA sequences or to make DNA molecules according to a sequence that you specify, has also been evolving in this way. Um, <clears throat> so as a consequence, there have been some very fundamental changes um, in what's possible. Um, so uh, this is just a press release that was put out a couple of years ago by a company called Complete Genomics. And what they're announcing there is the technology to sequence human genomes for $5,000 a piece. Now to put that in perspective, the first human genome was finished in 2003 at the cost of about a billion dollars. Um, so, so, you know, so just in six short years, we've gone from a billion dollars to several thousand dollars, and that, that change is immense. And so what that means is that probably within the next five or ten years, um, 
sequencing individual humans will be something which will be quite routine. On the DNA synthesis side, we've got the possibility now to do things that we'd never thought possible before. So um, this is a press release from the Craig Venture Institute where they have announced the first synthetic bacterial cell that they created. Um, and what they mean by that is that they were able to sequence, oh sorry, synthesize the DNA sequence for this bacterium entirely from scratch. It's about a, a million DNA letters long and they synthesized that entirely from scratch and then they put that into a cell and made that cell work. Um, now that at the moment is still something that is incredibly expensive, um, but if the trends continue the way that they, they, they are so far, that's something that will be possible at the several thousand dollar price range within 10 or 20 years. And so, um, so this is definitely the time to get into synthetic biology because um, the ability to make synthetic DNA sequences is something that is only gonna get cheaper. Okay, so what happens if you wanna get into this? Um, so what are the careers in synthetic biology? So of course, um, you can work in research and development, um, which is what Claudia and I do. Um, so you can work for industry. Uh, most of those industrial jobs, at least at the moment, as Claudia pointed out, are overseas, uh, mostly in the United States. Um, but there's no reason to think that there won't be companies starting up uh, in Australia in this field. Um, so you can work as a scientist or an engineer in industry, um, or you can work in academic research. Um, beyond research and development, there are many other things that will come up that, that will be necessary as a result of sort of a, a new scientific field um, becoming mainstream. So there's jobs in ethics and regulation of the field. Um, so we'll need legal ex experts who know about the science and who can inform, uh, who can inform policy and of course policy makers and advisors. Um, there's also uh, a lot of work to be done in scientific communication, so in communicating uh, this new field uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, you know, to the public. Um, so I can talk a little bit about, I, I'm less familiar with, with what's involved in, in getting a career in ethics and regulation or in communication. There are certainly people around who can, who can talk more about that. Um, my background um, will give you an idea of what you would need to get into research and development. So I have a bachelor's uh, in computer engineering and, and in math from um, the University of Melbourne. And then I got my master's and PhD um, in electrical engineering and computer science uh, at, uh, uh, in the United States at MIT. Um, and then, so that was all in training as an engineer in, in sort of computer science skills. Um, and then after that, I did postdoctoral training um, at Harvard Medical School in genetics. Um, and I trained there um, under a guy by the name of George Church, um, who is one of the very influential people in the field of synthetic biology and, and other fields of genetics as well. Um, so, um, so certainly in order to do academic research, that long training path, which would be about 10 years or so, would be necessary. So you'd have to do bachelor's, master's, um, PhD and probably postdoctoral training as well. Um, for jobs in industry, a shorter training path may be possible. Um, uh, the, the last thing that I wanted to point out is that, you know, so I have a training, uh, well, I trained in a sort of in electroengineering um, and then finally got a biological training. Of course, for people uh, now, there are, there's a possibility to train more directly uh, in fields that relate to synthetic biology. So it wasn't really possible for, for Claudia or for me to, to get a training in this field because that didn't really exist at the time. So we've had training in related fields and then, and then started to work in this area. Um, um, but now, uh, if you wanna get um, a combined training in computer skills and in mathematics um, and in biology, which are all skills that are useful uh, and necessary for doing work in synthetic biology, that's possible. So for example, my university, Rutgers University, offers uh, a training in just this, but there are also um, uh, universities in Australia that are developing programs um, directed at, at that kind of training. Um, and so at that, um, I'll stop. Yeah. Uh, okay, thanks very much, Desmond and Claudia. Desmond, if you'd like to take a seat right. with Claudia here. I'll now take questions online, so if you have any questions and you're watching online, please type them into the text chat box and I'll ask them on your behalf. So the first question that we've had come up 
um, from John. Currently, we have controls here in South Australia about growing genetically modified plants. Uh, what are the controls with synthetic biological organisms and would there not be a greater level of concern with them? Yeah, okay, so I, I can probably um, do a fairly good job of answering this one uh, because my background is actually in agricultural engineering. Um, I'll start again. So my background is in agricultural engineering, so I know a little bit about the, um, the ethics and the legals around um, plant biotechnology and genetically modified organisms. So in Australia, we have extremely strict regulations relative to um, other parts of the world and other countries. So it's actually um, very hard to get genetically modified organisms out into the environment here in Australia. Um, and that goes for any genetically modified organism and regardless of what tool you use to make it, whether you use plain old genetic modification, metabolic engineering, synthetic biology or any combination of those. So the tools that we're actually using, I mean synthetic biology as a tool is actually using the same sorts of technologies that we already have been using for many years. And a lot of the uh, legal frameworks and at least the, the legislative requirements and the regulations are already in place that can um, uh, regulate this technology appropriately, um, they may require some tweaking for specific things relating to synthetic biology, um, but there certainly is a lot of processes um, in place now. The other thing about the organisms that we're working with, they're primarily microbes and uh, so yeast and bacteria, and you keep those contained in large, well, fermentation vats made out of stainless steel. So you're in effect, and, and they're inside a, a containment facility inside a building, so you're not actually releasing them into the environment. So I think a lot of people are generally a fair amount more comfortable with that than with the idea of genetically modified plants in the soil. Did you want to add anything to that, Desmond? No, I thought that was very good. <laughs> Okay, we have another question from Natalie. Um, research involving organisms often has to go through ethics committees. If you're creating entirely new organisms, are the issues of ethics in their use of a greater or lesser problem? You want to have a go Okay, this I mean, I th um, should I take the microphone or can you hear me already? Okay. Um, so I think the ethics around synthetic organisms are going to be... Um, and this relates a little bit to, to Claudia's answer to the previous question, um, are going to be related to the ethics that we've already developed around uh, genetically modified organisms. Um, there will be some new issues um, because it is um, taking genetic engineering further, um, but we are um, subject to um, the same sort of biosafety uh, requirements uh, in, in our work as, as, as any um, uh, anybody working in a university environment. Um, and I think as the field continues to evolve and as the issues become clearer, um, these, you know, these ethical questions and what we need to do with them, um, I, I think that we will continue to have to grapple with. Um, I had another question. Um, you spoke about the biobricks, Claudia. Yep. Um, so what are some of the bare essential things that a cell needs. So what are some of the things that you would find in the toolbox or what are, what are the really bare essentials? Okay, that's, that's actually a, a quite a complex <laughs> question to answer. The real answer is we don't know <laughs> and we're trying to work that out and once, once we do know that, then that, at that time we'll really be able to start building synthetic organisms. But if you look at the bare minimum, you need something that carries a code, so you need some DNA or something that looks like DNA, and there are other options known as orthologous biology, things that behave the same way as biology but aren't actually the same as biology. So you need a code. You need something to contain that code, um, so you need a chromosome or something like that. You need to be able to take that code and translate it to the protein, which is the workhorse, so um, an RNA, or a, a message system. So in other words, you need to be able to code for the message system within the code that you're using to write the message system and the messages. Um, and you need the proteins, of course, or something that looks like proteins. You also need to have uh, a cell membrane or something that surrounds it and contains it. Um, those are the basic things, the very basic building blocks, so lipids and such forth that make up your cell membranes. On top of that, if you're looking at a particular industrial chemical, you need to have modules that are specific for that process. So 
if for example you're making a biofuel it's almost definitely going to be toxic to the cell so you need to have a module in the cell that helps deal with that toxicity if you're making again any any particular uh, product then you need to have a pathway that's specific for that product so in our case we need to have a pathway that makes these 10 carbon and 15 carbon compounds in the case of artemisinin you need to make have a pathway that makes the, the precursor to the artemisinin and you need to insert that. So I guess that, that sort of thing. Now the Biobricks Foundation um, is more about having sequences that can be used to control how genes are expressed in a particular organism. So that means um, things that we call promoters, which are the elements that tell the gene how, when, how much and where to express the actual protein that it encodes. So things like that, genetic components that we can mix and match and put together. Thank you. Um, we have another question from John. Where are the limits? You have referred to bacteria mostly. Is it possible to make algae and increasingly more complex organisms such as eukaryotes? So I think we'd all like to do synthetic biology in eukaryotes and there are quite a few people doing that or playing around with doing that. Um, most of the work is focused on, on bacteria, on prokaryotes, because, well, because they're simpler, because we understand them better. Um, the, there's no limit, at least that you know, we're aware of at the moment, for why we can't do what we're doing with prokaryotes and eukaryotes. It's just the limit at the moment is just in our understanding. So there are you know, some uh, features of eukaryotes that are harder to engineer or harder to modify, because we just don't understand them as well. Hmm. Yeah, so <laughs> eukaryotes are much better at controlling what goes on in the cell. It's a concept called homeostasis, which you've probably come across at some stage in your teaching. And eukaryotes are a bit better at controlling them themselves. That means it's harder for us to break through that regulation and control them. So we are, we are working um, more in yeast, which is, it's a microbe, it's a single-celled organism, but it is a eukaryote, so it has a nucleus. And it is much more difficult to work with because it does have a lot more, lot stronger control and regulation over its metabolic network. And then moving into plants and, of course, more complex organisms, it does become more difficult. Um, we have a question from Hassan. What facilities are available in Australia to do this research as this is a new field of research? Okay, I guess I'm probably best to answer this one as well. <laughs> so there are very few places in Australia that do synthetic biology per se, but there are many places in Australia that have the facilities to do synthetic biology. So in Australia at the moment, we're being limited, I guess, more by the people who are here and the people who are trained in synthetic biology technologies. So um, really in terms of a proper synthetic biology lab, our lab, that's the Australian Institute for Bioengineering and Nanotechnology and the Systems and Synthetic Biology group within that, is the only one which is really sort of, I guess, doing synthetic biology per se. And we, offer, we ourselves operate in a fairly soft end of synthetic biology, so we aren't creating synthetic life the way that Craig Venter is. We're doing more sort of metabolic engineering and redirecting carbon through metabolic networks to increase um, flux or productivity of a particular product of interest, and we're using some synthetic biology tools to do that rather than actually creating um, uh, synthetic organisms that look blue and things like that. Okay. I mean, so yeah, the facilities that you need to do synthetic biology are quite minimal. Uh, and there are, uh, you know, so uh, one of the movements that has received some publicity is people trying to do synthetic biology experiments in their garages. Um, and it's not, it's not easy, but you know, certainly parts of it are, are quite possible. Um, and so there's nothing limiting, um, limiting Australia from doing more of it, um, mm -hmm. except you know expertise. And we have, uh, in fact, you know, we have homegrown companies uh, that synthesise DNA. Um, mm -hmm. So you know everything's there. <laughs> um, Desmond, I had a question for you. Um, how soon until the biodiesel project that you're working on would be ready to be? used, do you think? <laughs> oh, we hate when, will, when will we be putting biodiesel made by synthetic biology into our cars? <laughs> um, so, yeah, these are very hard questions. Um, and, uh, the, you know, um, uh, I, I do 
speak from time to time with people who are interested in commercialization, and of course this is the first question they want to know. Um, I think, um, I actually think it's much sooner than, uh, than people think it will be. Either, you know, there will be, um, in fact, you know, you can get um, biodiesel um, right now, it's just incredibly expensive. Um, to get biodiesel that is produced in the process that I've talked about, uh, I, you know, I would be surprised that that would happen, you know, I, I would see it as a five to ten year time frame, but I think it probably will happen. Um, maybe not exactly as I've outlined it, but improvements to the way that we do biodiesel production to make it cheaper using biological engineering will almost certainly happen. I'm a bit more optimistic. I think we're seeing it sooner. I think within five years easily we'll see industrial scale and... Um, oh, yeah. Oh, no, yeah, no doubt. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just a question of whether or not biodiesel will be able to compete at a price point with fossil mm. di fuel diesel within that time, and I'm not sure whether yep. that will happen. Yep. Uh. Okay, we have another question from Pam. Um, what are some of the techniques currently used in synthetic biology? Uh, for example, um, uh, any techniques based on transposons? Yeah, this might be something that <laughs> somebody wanted to know a bit more about. Synthetic biology using transposons. <laughs> well, <laughs> the tra but let me explain first what a transposon is for everybody else. So a transposon is, is what we call a subgenomic parasite. I love that phrase, it's so cool. So what that means is it's a little piece of DNA that's a parasite like a virus, but it lives inside the DNA of the host organism. And it can chop itself out of the DNA and jump around the DNA and insert itself in different locations in the DNA. So it's really quite an interesting thing. And they're really important um, for evolution, for um, uh, in introducing changes into the DNA that uh, evolutionary processes can then work on. Um, and they also carry different traits, like maybe herbicide resistance or something like that. And I specifically use the herbicide resistance example because these guys are known um, best from plants, in particular things like corn. So sometimes in corn, you'll see like a kernel that's red instead of yellow, and that might come from a transposon jumping into a particular gene that's related to the, the pigments that are actually produced in the corn. Now, I don't know examples, I don't have any examples where people use transposons in spe specific for synthetic biology, but there's a really nice example um, where people use something called scaffolding of proteins. And that works like this. So say you've got a pathway for a particular product. So you have a protein that catalyzes a step that causes metabolite A to turn into metabolite B. And then you have another protein that causes metabolite B to turn into metabolite C. And a third protein that has metabolite C to turn into metabolite D. And these are the one that you want. Now, so you've got three proteins in a pathway. And you want to actually make the carbon, which is your, your um, quantum of energy, I guess, you want it to get to metabolite D as quickly and efficiently as possible um, and as much as possible. And it turns out that if you take those, those uh, three proteins and sort of scaffold them together, hang them off a matrix so that there's perhaps increased the numbers as well, then that whole process works, can work a lot more quickly and a lot more efficient, efficiently. You can get more carbon faster to the product that you want. So that's one really nice example of synthetic biology. Do you want to give another example? Uh, I thought you okay. covered that. <laughs> I thought you covered that very well. I mean, at least you know, in relation to the transposons, um, there are certainly yeah, many things that we can do with synthetic biology. And if you know, maybe the circuit circuit example. Sure, is sure, nice. right. I mean, so um, so that's right. So we can create synthetic biology or circuits through synthetic biology, um, and uh, and people do do this. So we can, um, for example, create a clock in a uh, in a bacterium a sequence of, um, of genes that turn on and off in a regular pattern. Um, and this is an example of a very simple circuit in the sense that you have something that turns on, it turns off the next thing, um, which then you know, turns on the next thing, and then this happens in a cycle. Um, so, and then of course you can have um, um, circuits in the sense, you know, much like a logic circuit, um, something that responds to um, to stimuli, environmental stimuli, with some sort of logic relationship. So, for example, if you know if the cell is exposed to light, 
and heat, then it will respond in a certain way. Okay, and we've got uh, one last question here. Um, if anybody watching online has any final questions, put them through now because we'll be um, finishing the session soon. Um, but we have another question here. What is the balance between private funding and public funding in this area? It seems like there are lots of commercial possibilities. Yeah, the commercial po possibility is enormous. And I'll, I'll talk about the situation in Australia and then... Yeah, I can, can talk, talk about the US. About yeah. the US. So in Australia, um, we get, I guess, almost all the research that we work on as a group is funded to one extent or another by the industry. We also get a, l a very large amount of funding from the Queensland State Government, who've been very generous to us over the last um, six or eight years in terms of synthetic biology research. Um, we do have access to funding through the federal government, but we don't actually get a lot of funding through them, so the ARC centres and such forth, which is where most researchers in Australia would go to get funding. And there's also other sort of, um, um, I guess, related to private industry or semi-private industry uh, that we can go to to get funding. So there's, there's a lot of um, industry funding which is, is funding the research that we do in Australia at the moment and some state, uh, state government, local government and um, federal government funding which is available. So the balance is, at the moment, the because of a few extremely large grants that we got, the balance is way in favour of the state government at the moment. Um, but that's, I guess, it's a, an unusual situation. Typically, we'd normally get more funding from industry for it. Um, so, in the United States, there's been a lot of money put into this area, um, both private and public money. Um, the um, so in terms of public money, um, the, the major funding agencies, um, the National Science Foundation um, and the National Institutes of Health um, have both put in quite significant chunks of money that lot, many of the a lot of the time it doesn't relate specifically to synthetic biology, but it's often directed towards something that synthetic biology can do. Um, in terms of private money, um, so in the United States, um, many of the projects that we've actually talked about have been commercialized um, and, uh, and the people who've been involved have spun out small companies um, that have been funded by venture capital. Um, the, actually, one of the very significant funders of synthetic biology work, especially in the biofuel area, um, are, the, um, are the petrochemical companies themselves. Um, so... Um, ExxonMobil made a, a very large um, um, grant in this area. Um, so yeah, so it is, it's, you know, it's happening all over the place. Um, I don't, it's very hard for me to know, uh, especially because it's, it's hard to you know, quantify what exactly counts as a synthetic biology grant, um, what the balance is. For my work, um, at the moment, I'm almost exclusively public funded. And we've got one last final question, sort of related, from Pam. Are there issues uh, with patenting with this amount of private funding? And is it the processes that are patented or the actual genomes? <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is incredibly controversial. Yeah, it's <laughs> really controversial. So uh. there, there are always issues with patenting. And if you're funded from private industry, then, of course, they want to get something back for the money that they're putting in. And that the expectation is that there will pa be patents that come from that. And I mean, that, that's sort of good for us as well as research scientists. We get our name on patents and potentially there's, there's you know, payback from that, that that you can then reinvest in your research and such forth. Um, there is, of course, this issue of patenting life and such forth, which is, a, is an extremely complicated ethical legal issue. I think uh, perhaps we'll probably do a better, better job of dealing that with that tomorrow when we have our legal and ethical experts on board. Um, th there's some things you can't patent, like I don't think you can patent um, DNA sequences that are found in nature nowadays. Someone can possibly check, yeah, confirm I'm that sure. for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, but processes that you create, like anything out there that anybody creates or or, or invents are patentable, and, and yeah, I think that's probably fair enough. Yeah, I mean, the, so the Venture Institute is a non-profit, but they have a commercial company called Synthetic Genomics Inc., um, <laughs> which is a for-profit company, 
um, and synthetic genomics has tried to um, patent um, the idea of a synthetic genome. Um, and that's very controversial. Um, so yeah. how far reaching that patent will be will have a significant effect on what, you know, what we can do. Um, and at the moment, that patent has not been approved. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and, you know, everybody hopes that, you know, what is, what in fact passes for the patent in the end will be something that will be quite reasonable and will allow everybody to do their work without having to give money to Craig Venter's company. <laughs> but <laughs> patents go through processes. <laughs> when the patent attorneys, bless <laughs> their little hearts, <laughs> write the patents, <laughs> they're extremely big and encompassing and they try to get everything they possibly can in there. And as they go through the approval process, they generally shaved down and tightened up and until it becomes like approaching reasonable what they actually want to patent. And of course, um, as time goes on, patents do get challenged. And so there may be a time in the future when um, that patent is challenged, if, if it ever is granted and if it's granted in a overly far-reaching way, then that may very well be challenged in the future. And we did just have one last question pop up. I will make this the last question for the session today. Um, but with um, GM getting such a heated reception and causing such divisions in society, what are the research facilities doing to educate the public on synthetic biology? <laughs> We're doing this. We're doing it right here. <laughs> so, so right here. Um, we also provide, there are ethics courses that are provided through most universities and we, we're encouraging our undergraduates to take part in those courses as well. Um, and it, I mean, it's just such a new science in Australia that we're really just, we're really just starting. Um, so we were in Canberra yesterday talking to some senior political advisors um, about this sort of thing and they were asking very similar sorts of questions and it's really important. And I think it's really wonderful that we're engaging now at the very beginning of the process um, before we're even actually really doing very much in Australia. So by the time we are actually doing serious synthetic biology in Australia, we should have the ethical legal aspects a lot more under control, a lot more worked out and, and also there'll be a lot more public communication between now and then as well and a lot more public education about it. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say that the synthetic biology community when it started um, was very much aware of um, of the ethical um, sort of issues that came up around GM, um, not only GM but also you know um, embryonic stem cells mm -hmm. um, and other areas of science, um, and um, and so the people who were involved in that early community of synthetic biology uh, realized that ethics was an important thing that they had to take head on um, at the beginning, and so I think that's something that has continued, um, and as we continue to do this work. Um, Engaging as much as possible with uh, with the public and to keep the dialogue open is what mm. you know. Is I think what we really have to do. Mm, absolutely, we learned our lesson from the genetically modified yeah. organism <laughs> experience, <laughs> especially with the plants. When as scientists we're all going, but we're just trying to do something good, and the public yeah. was saying we're unhappy with this, and and yeah. it took quite some time for the scientists to take that on board, and and now I think there's a much better understanding and appreciating uh, appreciation in the scientific community that. What we do, we have to be accountable for and we have to be engaging with the ethical and legal side of things, so, yeah. All right, well, I think we'll draw the formal part to a conclusion there. Thank you very much, Claudia and Desmond, for taking part in the PD Plus session today. We Thank really for appreciate us. that. Um, for anyone watching online, um, well, I just wanted to remind you, if any of you are in Adelaide or in South Australia, tomorrow night here at the Science Exchange we'll be running a public event with Claudia and Desmond and also with some uh, a legal researcher and an ethicist. And it's called Synthetic Biology, What Does It Mean For You? And we still have places available if you'd like to book for that event. Um, you can go to the RIOS website to do that. And if you're also coming to Adelaide in the next couple of months, we have an exhibition which is opening this evening called Life 2.0, uh, which is all looking at lots of the issues and themes uh, around synthetic biology. Um, so that's a bit of a different way of looking at this sort of topic. Um, we also have the teacher resource pack notes available to download, which have a lot of background information and classroom activities that you can use. Um, so we hope that they're useful. Um, so thank you very much for joining us this afternoon and thanks again, Claudia and Desmond. <laughs>